Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the North Carolina Maritime Museum. My name is Ben, and I work in the education department here at the museum. We put on all types of educational programs for people where we teach you about North Carolina's maritime history, culture, and environment. Today's program is part of our lecture series, our maritime heritage series of presentations, uh, which staff put together. Uh, is essentially a slideshow of images, and we try to tell a story that goes along with those pictures. Um, today's topic is the North Carolina Outer Banks. So thank you for coming to the presentation, and thank you to those that are watching from the comfort of their home or wherever they are in the virtual war world. So you guys don't have to worry in the audience here in the room, you're not being recorded, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to make me laugh too much or something. Um, and uh, the recording will be available as well later on our website. Uh, but some people are watching virtually uh, through the internet right now. So <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, what I plan to do with this particular topic is really kind of give a broad overview of the geologic history of our North Carolina's outer barrier islands and a little bit of the cultural history as well. So to kind of like bring you through time, if you will, um, for the many, many years that the Outer Banks has existed. Um, I imagine that most of you in this room have probably been to the North Carolina Outer Banks, right? If we raised our hands, it would probably be everyone here. Um, and I'm sure if you haven't, you've probably at least heard of them. Um, you know, they, they conjure up a lot of images. For some, it's just the beautiful beaches. Uh, maybe it's fishing off of a pier or on the beach, uh, playing in the water, um, you know, going out on a boat, leaving from one of the marinas along the Outer Banks. Uh, or maybe it's learning about the history of it or spending time in the, the uh, natural um, places along those islands uh, in the maritime forest or along the marsh uh, and, and beach areas. Um, for whatever reason it is, or for whatever comes up in your mind, I mean, that attracts, uh, this area attracts many, many, many people. Um, the last few years, the Cape Hatteras National Seashore, which comprises most of the Outer Banks, has seen increased visitation um, drastically. Quite a few people every year visit our coast um, and go to the Outer Banks. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll just kind of wait till the end of the presentation um, in, in the name of time. I've got about 60 slides to go through, and I don't want to keep you here through lunch, or you may be asking me for something to eat. Uh, and I don't have anything except a pack of uh, nabs. So. Um, let's go ahead and get started then. So this presentation is on the Outer Banks. Uh, what are the Outer Banks or what are barrier islands? Uh, someone had asked me that question earlier and I'll do my best to, to answer that. Um, the Outer Banks of North Carolina are thin stretches of barrier islands or islands, if you will, uh, referred to some people as the banks, uh, especially maybe local people, uh, and at least definitely here in Carteret County. Um, now, uh, I can speak as a former resident of part of the Outer Banks. I used to live in Dare County. And I used to live in Nags Head and I worked there for a while. Um, and I never really heard anyone there, local people use the term banks, but when I moved to this part of the coast about 20, uh, some years ago, I, I often heard them refer to the Outer Banks as just the banks. They're going to the banks. Um, so they're known mostly today as the Outer Banks. But the reason we call them that is if you look at this satellite image, uh, you can see that um, I'm going to try and get my little laser pointer on the screen. Can you see the red? There we go. Okay, so when we say outer barrier islands, we're talking about this thin stretch of sandy islands 
that extend off of our coast out here to the Atlantic Ocean, um, which is obviously on the right-hand side of the image. Um, we, we call them the outer banks because they are out there. They are uh, separated from the mainland of Eastern North Carolina by this large body of water that we know of as the Pamlico Sound. So uh, if you were to ask people, where are the Outer Banks? Which islands are specifically the Outer Banks? Um, I'm sure it's up to debate. <laughs> uh, it wasn't, um, you know, I was living in Dare County when the whole OBX movement started and people started to refer to that area as OBX. Um, I don't really still know what that means today. <laughs> uh, if it was Outer Banks Extreme or something, maybe. Uh, Outer Banks X sometimes means crossroads. I don't know. Uh, and then I've heard people refer to this stretch of the islands along Carteret County as the Southern Outer Banks. Well, if those are the Southern Outer Banks, these could be the Central Outer Banks, and then these could be the Northern Outer Banks. You know, call it whatever you want to. <laughs> uh, we're not going to uh, grade anybody on what they want to refer to the region as. Um, so what is a barrier island like? Uh, well, I mentioned that they're sandy islands. They're mostly pretty much comprised, the island itself, of nothing but sand. Um, now, there, it goes way down. I mean, it's attached to the Earth's crust. It's not just floating, like a floating island. I've had people tell me that, you know, those islands are sinking. They're sinking into the water. They're, and, and to me, that makes it sound like it's floating there. But it, it's definitely not floating there. I mean, there's a lot of sand and mud and stuff underneath. Um, this image, and it's probably hard for you to read the, the words from way out in the audience there. So I'll kind of go over it real quick with you. This is like taking a thin, long barrier island and cutting it a cross section of it, if you will. Like if you took a carrot and cut it in half and you looked uh, in the, in, on that slice, that sliced edge. So on the left picture, the uh, uh, left of this image, we see the ocean. Uh, if we're gonna walk our way across the barrier island, we'll start on the ocean side. We come up the beach. This is probably what most of us are familiar with where we go sunbathing, surf fishing, throwing a Frisbee, playing beach volleyball. Uh, and then we start to experience as we go up in elevation, the dune field, uh, the first sand dune that you get to, people often refer to as the primary dune line. It's the first dune line you get to as, as you're coming out of the water. Um, and then you start to come maybe down the backside of the dune and it slopes downward. Um, in, this section that has labeled as a shrub thicket. Uh, so maybe you have wax myrtles and cedars and yopons that are kind of scrubby. They're affected by the salt spray coming off the ocean. And then we have larger uh, tree specimens in a maritime forest. Why is that? Why are those maritime forests there? There's another section here. Um, well, they're protected from the salt spray and the overwash of the ocean because of the sand dunes. So a lot of early inhabitants and, and settlers that lived along the outer banks resided in the maritime forests. It was safer, it was protected. Um, it, in some areas as depicted here, you may have a freshwater marsh or swamp in the dune swales, the areas where the, the sand dunes have dipped down lower and fresh water has collected in the pond. You may have that. Um, as you continue to walk, you get now to the back side of the island or the leeward side of the island, the side opposite of the ocean, and you experience more water in the form of the brackish uh, estuarine waters of the sound. Um, and that's what this stretch is referring to here. It says sound, and you might have salt marsh grasses along the shoreline. And as you go down into the water, you'll have uh, eel grasses. Um, you might have oyster beds, and that's what it says in there, sand and mud flats, seagrass beds. And then you walk across the sound 
and in some places you can almost do that. It's so shallow. Um, you get to the mainland where you have more of the uh, forest areas. So it's just kind of a generic look at a barrier island. How did the Outer Banks form? Why does he have a picture of the mountains up here? Uh, that's the reason why we have a nice sandy coastline. You know, they say that these mountains, the Appalachian Mountains, the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina were as big as the Rocky Mountains at one point with peaks of 14,000 feet. You think about a mountain forming, and we see mountains form today when volcanoes, you know, sea mounts erupt and volcanoes come up and they add land. Um, well, when these mountains formed, it wasn't volcanoes, it was plates colliding. You didn't know you were going to get a little geological history here. I'm not going to test anybody on this. So I'm, you know, everyone looks concerned, but be, please, there will not be a test. Um, as these mountains form, as soon as the mountains form, and mountains form this way all over the world, all over our planet, sometimes plates collide and things shift. Uh, we're talking it's hard for us to fathom because these things happen over millions of years, literally. Um, so the minute they form though, they start eroding because of the weather, because of the rain, the, the sediment and, and the rocks and things that make up the mountain erode every day. Every time there's a, a rainstorm, it comes off the mountain, goes in the creeks, the streams, the rivers, and it empties out onto our coast. So the finer sandy particles made it out to the coast over time. And uh, we, it gave us our beautiful sandy beaches, basically uh, all along the Virginia, the Carolinas, uh, and, and even into Florida, Georgia, uh, and, and parts of the uh, Gulf Coast there. I mean, the sandy beaches formed in many of these regions. In some places you see erosion, like on the West Coast, you see erosion happen right from the mountain into the ocean, where the erosion takes place and you have cliff sides and mountain sides dropping right into the ocean. Um, so I have a picture just of a, uh, a, one of our beautiful beaches that we have here along our outer banks. Um, all types of sediments were deposited along the coastline as, as the Blue Ridge Mountains made their way to the ocean, made their way to the shore. Uh, different types of minerals, quartz and feldspar, magnetite, garnet, uh, some I can't really pronounce, calcium, magnesium. Um, again, no test, don't worry. And, and you're, you're probably like this, I didn't sign up for a class here today, but <laughs> I, I just am trying to like you know, give you some geological background to our outer banks and why they exist and how they formed. Uh, when you think about the sand as it washed down and ended up along the coast, um, well, how did we get the island? The sand is now there on the coast, but how did the island come about? We see on the picture on the left, we see the beach ridge or the sand dunes that have stuck up here by the ocean, um, but there's, there's the ocean, it's only on one side. So a lot of geologists uh, believe that um, as the periods uh, of the ice ages changed uh, on our planet, water levels came up and went down. So at one period, they came up and over the barrier islands and maybe covered them and they existed, the sand, they came over the sand dunes and they existed nothing more as just sandbars. Uh, we still have sandbars today. You may experience them when you swim out to one and you go through the trough right, in this, uh, right along the beach, it's deep, and then it gets shallow again. You're on a sandbar. So some geologists believe that our Barrier islands started as sandbars when sea level was higher and they were the sand dunes were submerged. Well, then sea level dropped a little bit. Water went back to the polar caps as things cooled off. We had a cooling and warming period. Um, and we saw this middle, the middle picture there, where it left some of the water behind the sand dunes, forming the sounds, maybe. Yeah. These are all theories on, on how they came about. Um, this last picture on the right is showing you that um, if you go through a period of warming again and the seas are rising again, that the islands can actually move. And this goes back to someone telling me the islands are sinking and were they floating? Um, how are they moving if they're not floating? 
well, they're not moving like this. They're actually moving over itself like this. Um, the sand is pushed over the island and it essentially moves back. And then dunes build up and it sits there for a while and you might have another storm and it will push those dunes back um, as the water may rise some. So uh, this is a, a picture of a nearby barrier island, maybe on the southern outer banks, if you will. This is Shackleford Banks. Um, in the picture, we're looking to uh, kind of the east, maybe a little bit east-southeast. My laser pointer is on Cape Lookout Point. So this whole stretch here is Shackleford Banks. So if we go over real quick, there's the ocean, there's the sandy beach, here are the dunes, here's the maritime forest. Uh, we might even see some little freshwater pond areas. And then we get to the back side of the island where we see the sound. And this particular body of water is known as back sound. Um, and I always like to, I don't know if you remember that little song when you're learning about the bones in your body and you say, you know, your shin bones connected to your knee bone, your knee bones connected to your hip bone or whatever, you go all the way through. I like to play that, that game with North Carolina sounds because the back sounds connected to the core sound, which is connected to the Pamlico sound, which is connected to the Croatan and the Roanoke sound is connected to the Albemarle sound, which is connected to the Curatuck sound. We, we can go the whole way um, up the coastline. I have one more of these, I have two more of these types of slides here, and then and then I'll get into the to the to the fun stuff. You know, I was talking about sea level changes, and we know that they've occurred um, depending on the temperature of our world, our planet. Um, some we have polar caps. We have a North Pole and a South Pole. That's where it's cold, and that's where ice is. Well, at warming warm periods, there was less ice, and the oceans were higher. Cold periods, there was more ice and the oceans were lower. That's what this slide depicts. So the white uh, area is the current shoreline, which is what we're familiar with. Um, we see North Carolina and we curve around in the Florida Peninsula. Um, the red line is what the ocean, where the ocean existed uh, in, with about 5 million or so years ago. Sea levels were much higher. Now, has anyone ever been to the Aurora Fossil Museum in Pamlico County? Anybody? I highly recommend it. Um, if you go to the Aurora Fossil Museum, the main reason the museum exists is because there happens to be a phosphate mine nearby where they dig phosphate material out of the ground. And think sometimes what they're digging out of the ground are shark teeth and whale bones and different types of marine uh, snail shells that have been buried for many, many, many years. And, that, and it's nowhere near the ocean. Uh, but that was evidence that the ocean was once there as those things died and settled to the bottom and got covered in sediment from the eroding mountains. Uh, and we look at this blue line, we see that the coastline during a cold period when the southern extent of the glacial ice came down to that yellow line there, our shoreline was much farther out to the ocean, out east. So I, it's, it really was hard for me to grasp for so long because like, I just couldn't understand how that could happen. But this uh, was showing that, this, la this slide here is showing where that uh, shoreline may have once existed, saying that these areas here were coastal waters. Okay, let's get into some more pictures and get away from those boring charts and uh, drawings and stuff. Uh, here's a good example of an overwash that occurred during Hurricane Dennis in 1999. And this is on Core Banks, one of the barrier islands of the Outer Banks. So you can see from this aerial photograph that as the storm surge came up, it pushed the sand over to the back to core sound over the island into the marsh and into the sound. This is a, uh, an aerial photograph of Drum Inlet along Core Banks. Um, and I put this in here to kind of show you how much sand is really involved around these islands. 
you have sandbars on the ocean side, you have sand flats and sandbars all around these inlets on the inside. The water, the water is coming and going with each tide. High tide water comes in, it might bring some sand with it. Low tide, the water runs out, it might take some sand with it. Um, a storm comes along and it might chew off part of the end of the island and then put, push the sand back here into the sound, or it may take it out here into the ocean. It may move sand along the beach in one direction or another. In the last slide, we saw how it pushed it right over. It's just sand and the wind and the waves and the water can move it pretty good. So these barrier islands, these outer banks are very dynamic. They're kind of always changing. You can see small changes day to day, depending on the weather. You can see big changes after a storm. Or if you haven't been to an island in five or 10 years, go back to it, see what it looks like. Does it look different? Uh, here are some inlets of yesteryear and some present inlets that are marked on this particular map. Um, <clears throat> they're labeled with numbers and then the numbers have the names of what they used to be. So if we go up to the Northern Outer Banks, if you will, we see one, two, three, four, five historic inlets, maybe even six that existed in the years past that do not exist today. What happened to them? Well, Mother Nature filled them in. The sand piled up and piled up and eventually filled in the inlet. They were called Old Currituck Inlet, New Currituck Inlet, Mosquito Inlet, uh, Trinity Harbor Inlet, Ro uh, Caffey's Inlet, Roanoke Inlet, Gunt Inlet, and then we finally get to Oregon Inlet. Um, but those have, ex have come and gone over the years. Look down here on Core Banks how many inlets we have, we've seen over the years. Whalebone, Swash, Sand Island, Drum Inlet, there's a familiar one, Cedar Inlet, South Core Inlet, Old Drum Inlet, South Core Number Inlet 2, Barden's Inlet. That one didn't form until 1933, um, Beaufort Inlet. Um, but the, the Drum Inlet to me is the funniest one because I can't keep track of it. How many times it comes and goes and which one is which? There's old drum inlet and new drum inlet. And then there's, there's new, new drum inlet and old, old new drum inlet and new old drum inlet. And it, I just don't keep track of it anymore. It's too difficult. Uh, how can an inlet form? How can one just all of a sudden form? You get a storm event that we've been talking about. So the water can come from the ocean side in, in a, in a, uh, exciting experience and bust through, or the water, the tide can come in before the things really get crazy and, the, and it can bust through from the backside, coming from the sound into the ocean. Here's an example right here. This is up on Hatteras Island. This village here in the back is Hatteras Village. This was in Hurricane Isabel in 2003, and the storm cut right through on the north side of Hatteras Village and separated it from the rest of the island. This is where Highway 12 would be. In this picture, it's covered with sand. How did the people of Hatteras get back and forth after this? Well, they had to rely on an emergency ferry operation. They had a ferry terminal, luckily. It takes people to Ocracoke. But in this situation, I think they were now taking people from uh, Hatteras Village to um, maybe Man's Harbor, but definitely also Swan Quarter. Um, and what happened to this inlet? Well, they bulldozed it and got dump trucks and filled it back in and repaved Highway 12. It's just sand. It's pretty easy to manipulate. There's a reason why my parents built me a sandbox when I was little. It was easy for for little Ben to manipulate the sand and build things and dig holes and fill them in. Uh, but we do that today with the big sandbox, the barrier islands. Sometimes we blow it up with dynamite. Here's a picture of they were reopening Drum Inlet. Um, 26 tons of explosives in 1971. I wasn't born, so I don't remember it. I didn't live here anyway when I was born. Um, does anyone else remember this? Is anyone from Carteret County? 
Did you hear the dynamite explosion in 1971 on December 23rd? <laughs> Maybe you did. Uh, so at one point when John Minlet had filled in, I think the push was that the uh, commercial, fish, uh, commercial fishing vessels needed to get out to the ocean so they could go catch seafood. Well, someone had the idea, <laughs> let's open the inlet back up. What is, this is what that picture is. <laughs> Somebody shared this with me about seven or eight years ago. I just couldn't believe it. But there's a photograph and there was a news article and there was, I believe after, it didn't completely do the job. So afterwards they actually started dredging, uh, sucking up sand and water and, and finishing the, uh, the reopening of Drum Inlet. I talked about these inlets and how they change quite a bit. This is a good um, demonstration here because this is the Western end of Shackleford Banks. Uh, this would be Beaufort Inlet. And on the left of the image, you can actually see Fort Macon, the historic uh, brick structure out there on the East end of Bogue Banks. And what's interesting to note is that you can also see one of the rock jetties that's placed out there. Uh, which is an attempt to stop the movement of sand. The other fixes of an eroding beach are to dredge the sand from somewhere and dump it on the beach. They do that quite often at Fort Macon. They don't wanna lose the historic structure there. There were two other forts at that point, well before Fort Macon, Fort Dobbs and Fort Hampton. I mean, one was destroyed by a hurricane and the other one fell in an inlet in, into Beaufort Inlet. Um, but if we look at Shackleford Banks, well, there's no historic fort over here, so nobody's really worried about the end of the island eroding away. And we see the changes that have occurred. But what's interesting to note is this red line is 2016. So that's kind of the most recent one. And it's probably even gone back a little bit further. This red and white candy cane looking line is 1946. So from 1946 all the way to 1998, the island actually grew. And then from uh, 1998 back to 2016, it shrunk again. So it's very dynamic, it's changing quite a bit. Now there is actually an old jetty on Shackleford Banks that, that is currently exposed, um, if you have not seen it, on the ocean side. I'm not talking about the little one back here by the dock on the sound side, or by the, uh, the, the uh, tidal pond there, I'm talking about the one on the ocean side. And it was built, probably built in the 40s, in, but maybe even earlier. There may have been an earlier version of it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start to kind of focus more on the cultural, uh, the, the human um, uh, aspect of this uh, particular program. I, I think I covered the barrier islands pretty good. We got a good understanding of who they are. Uh, people have lived on those barrier islands and have foraged for food and hunted on those barrier islands and harvested seafood from around those islands as well. So these are just some place names um, that may come up in, in the next few slides. Um, there's Cape Hatteras, Hatteras Island. We talked about that. Here's Pamlico Sound. And I have in parentheses, it says Verrazano's Sea. Um, Core Banks, Cape Lookout, Shackleford Banks. Here we are in Beaufort down here. Um, so you guys are probably familiar with this stuff. So, okay, what's Verrazano C? There's Verrazano right there. He was the, the Italian uh, explorer, um, Giovanni de Verrazano, sailing for France, and he explores the eastern coast of America. He is the first recorded European contact with North Carolina in 1524. And they say that he came up along the Outer Banks and sent out a party to explore. And they look over at Pamlico Sound and they think it's the Pacific Ocean. They think they found the easy passageway uh, to the, the, um, the east, but it, obviously it wasn't, it was Pamlico Sound. <laughs> um, now we're probably more familiar with Sir Walter Raleigh's expeditions and the lost colony story uh, up uh, it, on Roanoke Island. Um, and we have the English exploring and set, attempting to settle in the area in the late 1500s. Now this uh, person here is Sir Richard Grenville. He was a captain of one of the vessels uh, in the, the second uh, 
uh, Sir Walter Raleigh expeditions um, to, to uh, Carolina. Um, and he, he uh, had a problem at Ocracoke Inlet when he tried to sail up from the south and get up to Roanoke Island. He ran aground. Um, and, and it could be possibly because of this man here could be the reason why we had so many wild ponies running the Outer Banks. Um, people would say, how long have the horses been there? Well, they've been there a very long time, um, not as old as the Outer, the outer Banks themselves. Um, but we could maybe say it was Sir Richard Grenville. He had traded with the Spanish in Puerto Rico when he had stopped there to make repairs to his ship. And he had trouble coming into Ocracoke Inlet. He ran aground and had to lighten the load, if you will. And horses are pretty heavy. And he had, if he had a lot of them, he sent them overboard and they swam off to the islands and been around ever since. But it's also possible that they came directly from the Spaniards when they had attempted some settlements in Florida and also as well in, in present day uh, South Carolina. Um, the horses could have been left behind, escaped, whatever. They may have traded. Uh, and they since uh, populated the coast, the islands. They said that there were thousands of them running up and down the Outer Banks, and they used to have uh, uh, pony roundups, or they would uh, they would round up the herd and they would auction them off, and you could get a you could get a pony if you wanted. Uh, and they did that even up through the 1960s. Um, there there was an annual event uh, at Cedar Island, I think, and they would you could go get a pony and take it home in your station wagon. Um, they're protected animals today, so don't don't really go near them. They're wild and they're protected. <laughs> That's my uh, public service announcement um, on the places where they exist on the national seashore and the, the uh, coastal reserves, they are protected by law. So uh, you can take pictures from a distance, 50 feet at, uh, at the closest, otherwise leave them alone. You're liable to get kicked or if someone documents you harassing them, then you get a citation. Uh, so you get, you get hit literally and then you get hit in the wallet, <laughs> I guess. Um, I put this, this uh, picture of a map here from 1590s uh, of the Carolina coast and the Outer Banks. And we see some Native American place names as the English were exploring and, and settling here. And they were trying to learn and uh, communicate and trade and interact with the native peoples of the area that had been enjoying the Outer Banks for many, many years before European settlers came. Uh, and in this picture, we see depictions of Indian villages or settlements or, or towns uh, there, there along the parts of the mainland. Uh, but there's one out here in what they call Croatan, um, which kind of corresponds with maybe Hatteras Island, but you know, a lot of names and such that were tried to uh, uh, taken from native uh, cultures were, were really kind of uh, not really translated very well by the English. Um, we see a depiction of the people themselves uh, and then little, little uh, canoes that they've made. Um, what, what, did they, what type of structures did they live in? This is a recreated uh, structure that they might have stayed in, something similar to native people. Uh, here, close up on what they look like. The drawing was by, by John White. He was on a voyage with Sir Richard Grenville, the, the man that we saw earlier in the slide. And I put a picture of the, the whelks and the clamshells there because uh, you can see in this drawing by John that they had all types of jewelry and beads and they used uh, these shells to make those things. The, the beautiful purple colors on the clamshell and the orange colors on the whelks. Um, they used those for decoration, trade it. They used it as money. Um, and then I zoomed in on uh, another chart here to kind of give you a better close up of the house structures in the, in the village. Uh, here's a, a fishing weir that they used to trap fish to get their food. There they are in their dugout canoe. Here's the English explorers coming into the sound. They're big ships wrecked out on the sandbars. <laughs> they call it, the, that's why we call it the graveyard of the Atlantic. Uh, the manner in which they made their, 
their dugout canoes by following the cypress trees um, and hollowing them out using fire and scraping away the charred wood. You know, water was, was the highway. Water was how everyone was getting around. Uh, this is a depiction of, of maybe a early type of small sailing vessel that the, the settlers would have used to get across the sounds uh, that we've talked about. Um, so I'm going to kind of like move through time here over the and cover some of the cultural uh, history to the area. So island life, you know, what was island life like? This picture's probably been used many times and definitely in, in a lot of the, uh, the uh, local museums and history uh, places. Um, you know, I know I use it in quite a bit of my presentations just because uh, it's a wonderful picture. I'm really glad that somebody took it. This picture is of Mr. Divine Guthrie, born on Shackleford Banks, one of the barrier islands, uh, and he was a boat builder. Um, here he is with one of the craft that he made. Um, what did they use the boats for to get around? Well, I mean, like I said, that was their highway. That's how they got from point A to point B. That's how everybody got around. Trying to traverse the land of Eastern North Carolina back then uh, was pretty difficult. Many swamps, many rivers, any wetlands, you couldn't really do it that good. It was easier to just go by boat. Um, maybe, maybe they were using their boat to go harpoon a whale. This is an engraving that was done in the 1890s of the whale fishing that took place on Shackleford Banks. There's the whale crew in the upper right of the image um, rowing after a whale. Now, whaling in North Carolina was something that did happen. They didn't really take a lot of whales. Um, they, were, they actually targeted bottlenose dolphin more than they did whales and harvested many more dolphin. Um, but similar, a, a similar style watercraft was eventually and later used by some of these fellas, the U.S. Life Saving Service, the early, the predecessor to the, to the Coast Guard. They performed shore-based rescues. The whalers were doing shore-based whaling. Well, these guys were doing shore-based rescues of shipwreck victims. This is the station that was at Kill Devil Hills. It was built in 1878. Can you read at the bottom and notice who took the picture? You might recognize that name. <laughs> uh, here, this uh, was just my attempt at showing you the, what it might have been like for those surfmen of, of the US Life Saving Service to launch it, their boat off the beach and row out to a shipwreck and save people. Thousands of shipwrecks along our outer banks. Um, and here's a picture of Wilbur and probably his brother Orville and maybe one of their friends or one of those lifesavers. The, the picture of the lifesaver that he took, those guys sometimes helped them. They might have been bored and said, we'll help you pull your glider back up the dune or we'll help you fix this or that. Um, you know, they lived in the community there and they uh, got to, knew, to know a lot of the locals, you know, you know people that were, why, why did they come here anyway? Uh, this is them testing their glider. That's not the the motorized, um, the engine on that one. Um, why, why did they come to the Outer Banks? Well, the, because of the dunes, because of the wind, this is Jockey's Ridge, the tallest active sand dune on the East Coast. So as I mentioned, most of the transportation was done by water. Um, the larger boats could be used to cover the vast sounds you know, where, where waves could be pretty treacherous. And the smaller ones were used to, you know, to navigate maybe the creeks and along the shores. Um, if you think of uh, maybe the pickup truck and station wagon of our times, you, that's what these boats were like. You'd use them to go get supplies or take something to the market or to go visit family or friends. Um, <clears throat> You use it to go do your fishing. This is another boat builder of North Carolina, George Washington Creef. And I like to highlight him because he created the, or at least he was a big player in the creation of these North Carolina shad boats, if you will, the state boat of North Carolina. We have a model of one on display in our gallery. Um, we, ought, we often work on, on one across the street lives permanently up in Manio. Uh, George Washington Creef's boathouse was on Roanoke Island. Um, and that's him in the picture there, if you can kind of tell. Um, 
here's a shad boat under sail. And they were designed for, for getting around in the sounds. They, this is maybe a smaller one. They came, they came in different sizes, depending on who built them. He wasn't the only one building them. But the boats were used for all kinds of things. Here's a mail boat. That's how they got the mail around. And I think those are packages of mail on the top. So if you lived on the Outer Banks and you wanted to have mail, well, the mail, you, you wanted to send a letter somewhere, you know, the, how did it get off the island? Well, the mail boat came. Um, and there were many different, different ones. This one is the, the mail boat Jane Crabtree. Uh, and they ran uh, between Cedar Island and Ocracoke and Ocracoke and Hatteras and Hatteras and uh, Roanoke Island. And sometimes they carried people too. If you wanted to get off of the island, you could hit, get a ride on the mail boat. People learned about these, these barrier islands, you know, people of the mainland and points farther west pretty early on and realized that they were a great place to go to in the summertime to get away from the heat and the humidity and the mosquitoes and bugs and such maybe of where they were. So they would go out and make their way out to the Outer Banks. Um, here is a, this is a little bit later photo, but 1915, Everyone's unloading at the dock and they're getting ready to go to Nags Head. And maybe they were gonna stay in the Arlington Hotel. This is a postcard from 1905. Um, and they can enjoy the sea breezes and take a dip in the ocean. Um, most of the people that had been living there for years and generations, they got to enjoy those things quite often, but you know, to them, it wasn't a vacation. They lived and survived there. It was more of a sustenance type lifestyle. It was a hardy lifestyle. You had to be tough you, to survive those storms and those winters and those winds. Um, so in the summertime, when things were maybe a little more pleasant, people would come and stay and visit. What did they do? Well, they'd go out fishing. Here they are, drum fishing in the surf in Nags Head. Uh, a postcard from the 50s of a, a day's catch on Ocracoke Island. All the big channel bass or the redfish out hanging up there after a day of fishing. Well, how did they get to Ocracoke? Well, they might've taken something like this. Uh, first, they had to get across Oregon Inlet. <laughs> this is one of the early ferry operations to get across Oregon Inlet. I don't know how old this postcard is, but the vehicles in the picture look pretty old to me. <laughs> And they could only really fit a few on there at a time. And then when you got to the island, you know, this is really what the roads were like. And this was probably the easiest way to get around for many years. Um, if you weren't going to sail and you wanted to go up the island, you might have had a, one of your banker ponies that you domesticated and had a few of and it pulled your cart, your cart along the path. Um, here's a Another postcard from Ocracoke Island, a typical street. This is just nothing but sand. A, a typical early road on Hatteras Island. And this image is in the North Carolina State Archives. It didn't have much detail to it, but I think it might be along the stretch there at Pea Island where there was an old bridge to get over what was called New Inlet an inlet that was open for a period, but then closed, and then recently kind of reopened nearby, and then they built a bridge over, but then it filled back in. Um, <laughs> but anyway, this was an earlier bridge, and I heard a story about, about the bus uh, almost going through this bridge at one point, but I, I don't know if it's true. I used to lead kayak trips under the remnants of that bridge there at Pea Island. Here's a picture of the bus of Hatteras, 1940s. So sometimes it was easy just to drive down the beach at low tide and you might encounter in that top left picture, that's a shipwreck, the remains of a ship on the beach and they were scattered up and down the island. Or you might, might be easier to ride along the backside of the island in this bottom picture and you can see some of the buildings in the villages there uh, and then what's left of an older vehicle. <laughs> it was just easier to leave it where it was and, and to, and to get it off the island, I suppose. Or maybe they're going to fix that one up someday. <laughs> I doubt it. Um, yeah, but the people that had lived in these areas for generations, you know, they 
they had what they needed to survive. They had schools, they had churches. This is on Ocracoke. Here's the post office in, out at Portsmouth Island. Another shot from Portsmouth Island, a, a church in the foreground. And then we see one of the residents hanging their laundry out to dry. So life was like it was in, in many places. It was just harder to get to. And they relied a, a lot on, on what they had around them as far as uh, harvesting from the sea. Um, but it didn't mean that they were isolated. It didn't mean that they didn't know anything. You know, there were a lot of sea captains along these villages that traveled many, many miles away and then experienced many, many different things um, that you wouldn't think they did. They went to the large cities of the Eastern seaboard and they sailed the Atlantic and they went back home because that's where their family was. So tourism st starts to take over at some point. Um, we start to see a change in, in the economies of, of the Outer Banks. Now, my colleague, David Bennett, he does several lectures that have been recorded and put on our website where he really dives into some of the tourism of the Outer Banks uh, area in um, Carteret County. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm just kind of, like I said, giving an overview here to, to show you these changes through time. Uh, taking a dip in the Atlantic, Nags Head and Kitty Hawk, a 1950s postcard. Um, Here's a later hotel. Uh, eventually, eventually a bridge would be built to Hatteras Island, 1963. So it really, really wasn't that long ago uh, that they had finally built a bridge. We're looking south, southeastward at uh, the north end of the island, or what some people call Pea Island. Um, so that opened up opportunities for people to go down there and, and try their luck at catching the big one. Um, as time went on, you know, the, the boats got faster, um, the fish got bigger, <laughs> they went offshore. This is down in, in uh, Hatteras, um, the charter fleet down there. So, I mean, we would, we would eventually, in some of these areas, see something like this. Um, you know, we, I had a postcard of the motel with a swimming pool, but now houses are built and they all have their own swimming pool. Um, I was confused by that as, as a young boy when I would vacation myself on the Outer Banks and thought, why did we need swimming pools when the ocean's right there? <laughs> but some people don't like to swim in the ocean and sometimes it's dangerous. So I eventually realized that, um, but for every house to have a pool, it's pretty convenient, I guess for folks that are on vacation. Um, you know, but the islands, the islands are still changing. We can't stop that part. We can't stop some of this. Uh, this is a, uh, this bridge is complete now. Um, this is the jug handle bridge of Highway 12 that uh, bypasses North Rodanthe, if you will, <laughs> and comes off of part of P Island. This is just the, one of the early computer drawings of what the bridge would look like as it came into town. Um, in, uh, as it bypassed this stretch here of uh, P Island Wildlife Refuge and part of Rodanthe Village. Um, so that, that, I mean, that was interesting to see in itself, this process. And now I think about when I, when I spent time there and I went up and down Highway 12 many, many times and to, to see these new bridges come in, you know, I mean, the Bonner Bridge, needed replaced it was old you know i mean it's um the same reason they're replacing the drawbridge here at beaufort and they did a, they're doing the one at harker's island i mean bridges they wear out they have a life expectancy but you know these other ones that they were doing were not because there was no bridge before but but now there is they, they did it because you know that the, the changing island this is an aerial photograph of that northern part of rodanthe in 2012 those are houses, beach houses, if you will, vacation homes. I don't think they were permanent residents, but look at those surf and the waves coming up. They came up under the houses at high tide. Um, you can see off to the left where we've had overwash 
sand pushed across the island. These were paved uh, cul-de-sacs here. But in this picture, this was after a hurricane. That's why they're covered in sand. They cleared Highway 12, but they had, did not clear this part yet. I have another picture of the same exact location, but eight years later. Look at the, they, so some of those houses are gone. <laughs> Where did they go? <laughs> uh, they cleared part of that cul-de-sac off there, um, but Highway 12 is still in the same location, but we're missing some of those houses. Um, you know, this last winter, they, there have been a few houses that fell in the ocean just south of the Rodanthe Pier. Um, some houses, they're moving. If, if the lot is deep enough, they've picked some up and move it. If they can move a lighthouse, they can easily move, move a beach cottage. And they used to, but they used to do it all the time. There was a reason they were built on stilts to begin with and it, to let the surge underneath. They didn't close in the bottom uh, and put in extra sleeping quarters or game rooms or home entertainment uh, rooms. They left it open and the storm surge would come in and go back. And some instances I heard of that they had trap doors in the bottom floor to let the floodwaters up into the house so that it wouldn't rip it off the pilings. The water would come in, they'd open the, they'd open the trap door, the water would come in, the water would subside, they'd sweep all the mud and sand out and then close the trap door. Um, and, if, and if things got to this point, they would cut it off its pilings and roll it back and lift it up. But when you have a house directly behind that one and one directly behind that one and one behind that, you can't move it anywhere. <laughs> they were lucky that there weren't so many uh, cottages behind the lighthouse uh, or they wouldn't be able to move that too. <laughs> um, but some of them that have the luxury to move back, uh, they do. So they don't end up in the ocean. Um, you know, what are the answers? I, I don't know why all the answers. I'm just giving a presentation about the Outer Banks. <laughs> Um, beach renourishment, they do that at the cost of millions of dollars, putting in rock jetties, they're not cheap either and they don't always work. Um, you know, so what, you know, what do you do? I, I, I don't know. But I know that the Outer Banks, uh, to me, is a special place and I enjoy visiting it. I, I love the fact that there is a national seashore to protect a lot of it, and as well as Cape Lookout National Seashore. Um, you know, they, they, they come with their histories, of course. Uh, but I know that a lot of people enjoy them. And I imagine that you do too. If you like to get out and walk the beach and look for shells or go fishing or swimming um, and just take in the scenery, the salty air, uh, the same thing that they were doing in the early years of the tourism along our coast. So um, that wraps up the presentation for today on the outer barrier islands or the outer banks of North Carolina. I hope you enjoyed it. Maybe you learned something. Um, Maybe, maybe you saw some pictures that you haven't before. Uh, either way, um, there's, there's each one of those topics that I covered, we could easily spend a semester talking about. <laughs> but I promise there wouldn't be any tests or anything. So thanks for coming to the presentation today. Our next upcoming lecture, I think, is uh, not next week, but the week after. And we've got one on um, uh, maritime myths and legends. And it's on a, I think it's on a Monday. It was for our Halloween special lecture. So, but uh, the, thank, thanks for coming. Uh, enjoy your visit to the museum today uh, and, and to Beaufort as well if you are from out of town. But please come back and, and, and visit again. Thank you. <laughs>